Okay, Carl, we can see now. Okay. So, uh, proceed with the second CME, which is the anterior crochet ligament reconstructions. And my supervisor is Mr. Karunizam. So this will be my outline of presentation. I'll present the, a bit briefly about the anatomy of uh, ACL and then the patient selection for ACL reconstructions, when to do the surgery, uh, ACL reconstruction techniques, and a bit of uh, anatomical versus non-anatomical reconstruction, and the uh, options including graft options, graft fixation options, and the co complications. Uh, in this presentation, I will strictly uh, focusing on ACL reconstructions for uh, clinical examination, uh, radiological examination, and also conservative management will be omitted here because of uh, time constraint. So briefly about the anatomy of uh, anterior crochet ligament. It is an intra-articular extrasynovial ligament located between the tibia and femur. And it is the primary anterior tibial translation stabilizer and also internal rotation stabilizer. And it consists of 90% of type 1 and 10% of type 3 collagen. And the size is roughly 30 mm in length and 10 mm in diameter. And studies have found that the ACL is not a uh, one ligament is consisted of uh, two bundles, which is the anterior medial bundle and the posterior lateral bundles. And as you can see from the pictures here, uh, ACL is uh, the origin is from the tibia, the, uh, tibia intercondylar eminence of the tibia, uh, tibia plateau. And the anterior medial origin is located just. Uh, lateral emptus medial to the lateral meniscus and the posterior lateral uh, origin is located around 7 to 8 mm posterior to the AM bundle. This is the tibia origin. As for the insertion over the femoral condyle region, uh, it's the same, uh, there's two bundle, AM and PL bundle. Both bundle are located posterior to the resident reach. And if you see on the true lateral uh, x-ray or the II, this corresponds to the Brumensac line. And the bifurcate reach is the one that is uh, separating the AM and PL bundle. So both AM and PL bundle, they have uh, diff different uh, biomechanics in terms of uh, stabilizing the knee. So the anterior medial bundle, it is stout in flexion and is the primary uh, stabilizing the anterior restraint. For, as for the PL bundle, it is stout in extension and the, the main uh, biomechanic function of PL bundle is for rotational restraint. And when the knee is in full extension, if you can see on the pictures uh, over here, in, if the knee is in full extension, both AM and PL bundle, they are parallel. Whereas when the knee is flexed in 90 degree flexion, the AM and PL are crossing each other. So a bit of the blood supply of the ACL. The ACL is mainly supplied by the genicular artery. And the genicular artery comes from the uh, middle and inferior genicular. And as for inferior genicular, it can be divided into medial and lateral inferior genicular artery. And bear in mind that all bony attachment do not provide blood supply to the ACL. So it mainly comes from this uh, genicular artery. And as for the nervous supply, is uh, supplied by articular branch of the tibial nerve. So uh, speaking of ACL reconstruction, we need to select our patients for the surgery. So these are the factors to consider prior to the surgery. First is the severity of the knee injury. You must assess clinically as well as radiologically uh, with the MRI, the degree of the tear, either complete or partial, and any other associated injuries. Uh, for example, the meniscus injuries, or the PLC or ALL uh, inju injuries. Uh, 
This will be important because if you fix the ACL uh, with the ACL reconstruction without addressing all these associated injuries, it born to be uh, failed. And the next factor to consider is the patient factors. For example, the age and underlying comorbidity, and also whether the patient has any symptoms. For example, the ligamental laxity or locking in the case of meniscus injury. And also consider the patient's activity level, uh, such as the sports and participation. And also the willingness of the patient to comply with the post-operative rehab protocol. The post-operative rehab protocol is very important for the patient to regain back the function after ACL reconstructions. However, not all patients require ACL reconstructions. As published in the MOJ uh, in 2014 by DeLon, it mentioned that the aim of uh, ACL reconstruction and therapy is to restore function, minimize symptoms, improve quality of life, and minimize future complications. Previously, it was thought that ACL deficient knee will lead to poor function, secondary meniscal injury, and secondary osteoarthritis. However, these are found to be not entirely true because studies have uh, found that at mid-term, around five years, there's no difference in meniscal surgery rate, osteoarthritis, and functional score in young patients treated with rehabilitation, early or late ACL reconstruction. And at long term, at 15 years, the outcome of the knee function symptoms as well as secondary osteoarthritis, they are almost as, uh, as good as uh, surgical reconstruction with conservative management. So it comes to the question of who needs ACL reconstructions. So those who will be benefited the most are the sportsmen who cannot alter their activity levels. For example, those uh, elite sportsmen who uh, get their income mainly from sports and also individuals with high demand such as laborer and also symptomatic patients with uh, instability and as well as those patients who require other uh, interventions such as for meniscus injury with presented with locking. So next is the timing of surgery. So when, when is the best time to do the ACL reconstruction? Uh, this article by Rushdi et al. in recent MOJ 2019 uh, shows that around eight patients, 5% uh, of the patient develop atrofibrosis uh, postoperatively after the ACL reconstruction. And the atrofibrosis is defined as loss of 15 degree extension or more with, uh, without flexion loss compared to contralateral knee. And they found that early surgical intervention, preoperative limited range of movement, and gen female gender are risk factors correlate with atrofibrosis. Another study in uh, an old study in 1991 uh, by Shelburne, uh, they examined 169 ACL reconstruction and found that those uh, operated within the first week had significant increased risk of atrofibrosis compared to those operated after 21 days. Another two studies also found the same thing. Atrofibrosis uh, is more prevalent within the first week if it operated early as compared to uh, operated after four weeks. And the other studies by Almikinders found that if the uh, patient is operated within four weeks, there's a limited range of movement early in the rehabilitation. But they found that no difference in range of movement after one year between the early and late uh, ACL reconstruction. So the, based on all this uh, literature review, the recommendations are uh, to do the surgery once the local factors and patient factors are satisfied. For local factors, you need to wait until the swelling subsided. 
and the patient achieve uh, adequate strength in quadriceps uh, muscle and also able to get full range of movement. As for the patient factors, patient need to be mentally prepared for the surgery and they need to sort out all the logistic issues uh, so that they can adhere to the post-operative rehab protocol. So next we come to the ACL reconstruction technique. Uh, previously, uh, ACL reconstruction are done through the open method, but this has been phased out due to the large incision, uh, more post-op pain as well as uh, poor cosmesis. So the current gold standard is the arthroscopic ACL reconstruction. Next is extra-articular or intra-articular. Uh, similar with the open technique, extra-articular has been phased out because of the poor uh, stability post-operatively. So the current gold standard is intra-articular ACL reconstruction. So the ACL reconstruction technique can be divided into a few phases. First, you must perform the diagnostic arthroscopy. Next, you harvest the graft and prepare the graft. And regarding the notch plasty is a bit controversial, which I will discuss later. And after you harvest the graft, you can drill the tibia and femoral tunnel and fix the graft. So speaking of notch plasty, is it needed? Previous uh, published by publication by Ranusio et al. in 2017, they mentioned that notch plasty is a complementary surgical procedure to widen the intercondylar notch and to avoid graft impingement. In their study of uh, 16 studies, they reviewed 16 studies, uh, including biomechanical studies, radiological studies, as well as clinical studies. And they found that the notch plasty are potentially associated with complications such as alter biomechanics as well as increased post-operative blood loss. And they also found that there's no clear benefit of notch plasty in primary ACL reconstructions. So they suggested that the management of atrofibrosis, treatment of osteophytosis, and revision of ACL uh, are the one who need who needs the notch plasty. So now uh, talking about the tunnel placement. So the tunnel placement can be trans tibial or uh, transportal. If you see on the pictures over the right side, this is the trans tibial uh, femoral tunnel placement. That means you drill through the tibia to get the tunnel over the femoral side. So both trans tibial and trans portal has their own pro and cons. So for trans tibial, the advantages are simple, less operated time, and you can preserve the uh, portal fat pad. But there are multiple disadvantages uh, regarding this technique. Yeah. The first is the vertical ACL graph. Uh, why the vertical ACL graph is uh, a disadvantage I will discuss later during the graft placement. And it is difficult to adjust the femoral tunnel and there's risk of posterior blowout over the femoral region. And posterior tibial tunnel placement are one of the disadvantages also. And when you drill through the tibial tunnel, sometimes you might accidentally get a large tibial tunnel and also you get a less pivot control because of vertical ACL graph. So now most of the time, uh, surgeons prefer the transportal uh, technique uh, because you can get independent femoral and tibial tunnel and you can customize the tunnel diameter and you can get the anatomical femoral tunnel as well as the anatomical tibial tunnel. The disadvantage of this transporter technique is it is technically difficult and you have limited vision and you might uh, get shorter tunnel length as compared to trans tibial approach. So speaking of uh, anatomical uh, placement of the uh, graph, you need to mention anatomical versus non-anatomical reconstruction. So this is the study uh, published in 2003, which uh, 
which are awarded the Richard O'Connor Award by John Lowe from Pittsburgh. They examine 10 human cadaveric knees and they compare the patella, the bone patella tendon bone graft at 10 o'clock as well as uh, 11 o'clock. And studies have shown that the 10 o'clock positions are more effective in rotational stability with equal anterior tibial stability. The next thing is the single bundle versus double bundle ACL reconstruction. So I put uh, three pictures here. So this is the non-anatomic single bundle where the uh, insert the placement of the femoral graft is over the center of AM bundle. Whereas for anatomical single bundle, if the placement of the graft over the femoral condyle is between the AM and PL, just at the center. So the difference between this and this is, this one you can achieve uh, more coronal, at, the ACL is placed in, at 10 o'clock as compared to 11 o'clock. Uh, if you place it in non-anatomical uh, femoral condyle area. So because of the coronal uh, placement of the ACL reconstruction graph, you, uh, you can achieve more rotational stability as well as uh, anterior stability will be the same. The, recently they have uh, mentioned that double bundle is better than the single bundle uh, reconstruction where they insert two uh, graphs individually at the AM and also PL uh, footprint. So is it clinically superior when you compare the double bundle versus single bundle? Uh, based on the two meta-analysis that I can found in 2010 and 2008, and they show that uh, in 2010, uh, this by Chen and et al, uh, they studied eight RCT comparing double bundle and single bundle, and they found no difference in terms of uh, functional outcome and re rupture rate, and also the rotational stability. And in 2008, also the same by Meredith Mer et al, uh, they studied four RCT, also no difference. So, uh, so who will be benefited the most from this uh, double bundle reconstruction? They suggested that it, will, it should be used in high level athletes. Uh. For example, uh, this gentleman who sustained ACL, who sustained ACL uh, tear during a match. Okay. So after talking about the placement of the graph, we need to mention about the graph options. So there are multiple graph options available in the market. The first one is the bone patella tendon bone autograph. Next is hamstring autograph, which are preferred in our population. Uh, this I will discuss later. Uh, quadriceps autograph and allograph and also synthetic graph. So each uh, Graph has its own pro and cons. I will discuss uh, each one, uh, all the advantages and disadvantages of uh, each graph and focusing on the technique of harvesting the hamstring autograph because that's what being uh, performed here in our center. So first, the bone patella bone graph, uh, it is a strong fixation and it is a bone to bone healing type of uh, incorporation where you uh, get all the bone from the patella and also patella tendon and because it is a bone to bone healing it can achieve a rapid incorporation with low failure rate and it is easy to harvest because it is uh, superficial and the patient can achieve a faster return to sports and achieve high level uh, activity but the disadvantage of uh, bone patella bone uh, autograph is you require a big anterior knee incision. And when you have an anterior knee incision, the patient might uh, potentially get anterior knee pain. 
and this will be not uh, advantageous in our population where most of the Muslim patients uh, requires kneeling for the prayers. And one of the disadvantages is the extension weakness because you harvest the patella tendon. And other uh, rare complications such as patellofemoral junction, uh, patellofemoral joint arthritis, as well as patella fractures. And also rarely you can uh, get saphenous nerve injury as well. The next is what we prefer, hamstring uh, autograph, where we harvest the semitendinosus as well as the gracilis tendon. The advantage is uh, small incision. Uh, this, the incision is mainly located over the pest and serenus area. And it has, uh, because of small incision, you has reduced uh, donor site mobility and reduced post-operative pain and also reduced stimulus. But the disadvantage are, uh, it is a soft tissue to bone healing. Hence, it has a slower incorporation. And it is relatively uh, less strong compared to bone patella, bone uh, graft. And the, it is harder to harvest, huh? but this is very subjective. If you have performed enough cases, this should be quite easy also. And another thing is uh, it has an inconsistent size. Sometimes the graft harvested might be too small or the graft might rupture halfway prior to getting the adequate length. And also, you might a bit you get a bit of a flexion weakness over the knee, as well as a saphenous nerve injury. So since uh, this is commonly done in our center, I'll uh, spend a bit of time uh, discussing this hamstring autograph uh, harvesting technique. Uh, for, for for more information, you can uh, search through this article where they discuss step by step. But I'll just uh, discuss the tech. Uh, a bit of uh, highlight points. Huh? First, you just uh, make the incision over the pest and serenus, which is located between the tibial tuberous teeth and midway between the tib tibial tuberous teeth and the posterior medial border of the tibia. And the incision you make around 2 to 3 cm in length and you incise the skin. After you incise the skin, you use uh, artery or the maximum uh, to open up the subcutaneous tissue. Uh, the blunt dissection is important because you want to avoid injuries uh, to the superficial medial collateral ligament as well as the saphenous nerve. The saphenous nerve, there are two branches, uh, the infrapatella as well as sartorial branches. So for the MCL, after the skin incision, uh, during blunt dissection, you can visualize the MCL so you can easily avoid it. For the saphenous nerve, because it is difficult to visualize it, so you need to uh, do the blunt dissection carefully to prevent the saphenous nerve injury. So after blunt dissection, you can go to the next layer. This is the sartorial fascia. After the subcutaneous tissue, you can identify the sartorial fascia. So the sartorial fascia can be incised uh, with a size 11 blade. And then after incision of the sartorial fascia, you can visualize the two tendons, uh, namely the gracilis and also the semitendinosus tendon. So how do you know that before incision of the sartorial fascia, you, have, uh, you can get the correct placement. So before you open up the sartorial fascia, you can feel it with your fingers. You can feel the row, rowing borders uh, of the gracilis as well or as the semitendinosus. So in that case, after you feel the placement, then only you make the incision of, on the sartorial fascia to get to identify the gracilis and semitendinosus. So after uh, identifying the gracilis and semitendinosus, you do the blunt dissection with the maximum uh, artery uh, to open up, to separate the gracilis as well as the uh, semitendinosus from the adhering to the sartorial fascia. You need to clear all the adhesions of the uh, adhesion to the 
fascia as well as the soft tissue to facilitate the harvesting later. If you, didn't, if you do not uh, separate the soft tissue from the tendon, what you, you get here is the graft might prematurely rupture. So you get a shorter graft as compared to a long graft that you want to get. So after separating the tendon from the surrounding soft tissue, you insert the tendon stripper for the first tendon. So for the first tendon, normally we uh, harvest the gracilis first. Huh? Then only we harvest the uh, femitendinosus. So you need to harvest one by one. Preferably, we like to get uh, around 10 cm of the length uh, for the both semiti and gracilis so that we can uh, get a, a good graph. For, okay. The next one is the quadriceps uh, autograph. So quadriceps autograph is also a bone tendon, uh, bone to bone incorporation as well. So it has a strong fixation, fast incorporation, and it has a reduced uh, donor site mobility compared to bone patella bone uh, uh, autograph. And it is also easy to harvest and you get a consistent and large size uh, graph. And it's also biomechanical. Excuse me. So it is a biomechanical sound because the quadriceps is an antagonist of the ACL. So by harvesting the quadriceps, you weaken the quadriceps, you, it is better to protect the ACL. Excuse me. Uh, any question? So I'll proceed. Eh? So the disadvantage of a uh, quadriceps autograph is a uh, large incision, and there's only one bone block at one end, uh, as compared to bone patella bone uh, autograph, which has two bone block at both the ends. So the Disadvantage just are almost the same as bone patella bone uh, autograph. You can get anterior weakness, anterior knee pain, extension weakness, and as well as poor cosmosis. So next is the uh, allograph. For allograph, the advantages are there's no incision needed and there's no donor site mobility and you can get a uh, reduced operative time and reduced post-op pain and also reduce pull off sinus because you didn't harvest any uh, autograph from the patient. But the disadvantages are slow incorporation and there's a high rate failure, high rate of graft failure. This mainly due to the irradiation of the allograph where you want to reduce the risk of uh, disease transmission you irradiate the allograph. By irradiating the radio, uh, allograph, you reduce the uh, strength of the allograph. And even you, if you do uh, irradiation, there is potential risk of uh, disease transmission. And next is the cost of the allograph might be a bit too expensive, whereas for autograph, it is free. Lastly, the synthetic graph. The synthetic graph, the advantages are almost the same as the allo graph, except there is no risk of disease transmission. And for the disadvantages, it's more or less the same, low, slow incorporation, expensive, but specifically for synthetic graph, there is a risk of wear debris, and there's a high failure rate also because of the lack of tissue ingrowth. And because of the wear debris, potentially it might induce uh, secondary osteoarthritis. So after the graph options, next is the graph fixation. So you, graph fixation is a device to hold the graph in place while the healing takes place. And uh, it's after the ACL reconstruction, the weakest period is during the immediately post-operatively. 
and the ADL and rehabilitation protocol will exert around 150 to 500 Newton uh, forces through the ACL graph. And individually for the graph, it can uh, withstand up to 2,000 to 4,000 Newton power, uh, forces. And for the fixation, it's around 500 uh, Newton power, Newton forces. So for the graph fixation, the ideal graph fixation device, it need to be anatomical and it, it should be biocompatible and it should be consistent with MRI compatible and if needed, you are able to revise it. So there are two graph fixation options, uh, namely the appendial fixation as well as suspensory fixation. For the appendial fixation, it is fixed at the level of the joint. For example, the interference screw. So the interference screw can be bioabsorbable or biocomposite. For the biocomposite, they incorporate the bit of calcium phosphate so that there's a higher uh, bone incorporation. And it can achieve up to ultimate, ultimate tensile strength of 400 to 700 Newton forces. As for the suspensory fixation, it is a fixation away from the joint. And the examples include endo button, cross pin, as well as staples. And each of them, they have a different uh, strength. So for the interference bio screw, the advantages are it is easy to use, direct bone to tendon healing, and you can reduce the graft tunnel motion and reduce the tunnel enlargement also by inserting the endo, by inserting the uh, bio screw into the tunnel. And it is MRI compatible. And it, it, the advan main advantage of uh, bio screw compared to the endo button and also the pin is it can reduce creep reduce bungee effect and also reduce windshield wiper effect. The disadvantages of uh, interference bioscrew are depends on the bone quality. Let's say the patient has a poor bone quality osteoporosis, then there will be loosening of the bioscrew. And you might potentially damage the graft uh, when you insert through the tunnel. And also there's risk of posterior wall blowout and when you insert the screw through the tunnel, there will potentially be a tissue reaction. And it is uh, oftentimes uh, difficult to remove uh, once you insert it into the tunnel. And sometimes the screw might break uh, inside the tunnel as well. And the loosening might be because of the degradative uh, enzymes. Uh. So as for the endo button, uh, it is easy to use and no graft damage uh, sustained and it does not depend on the bone quality and there's reduced risk of posterior wall blowout. But the disadvantages are the bungee effect, windfield wiper effect and also tunnel enlargement. For the bungee effect as shown in these uh, figures, it is the longitudinal lengthening of the uh, ACL. And also, whereas for the wind field wiper effect, it is the uh, horizontal movement from the lateral view, like horizontal movement uh, of the ACL graph. So what are the evidence to support uh, one or another? So this uh, literature review this uh, review article compared the suspensory versus aperture fixation, and they compile all a total of 41 studies, and they compare 20 suspensory and also 21 aperture uh, studies, and they found that there are fewer graft rupture in suspensory fixation, whereas uh, there's no functional score or pivot shift difference in terms of these two fixation techniques. Another recently published uh, article, uh, it is a meta-analysis where they, com they compare uh, the endo button with the suspensory 
the suspensoric and the button with the interference group. So they review five RCT and four comparatively studies. And they found that in a total of 613 patients, there's no uh, difference uh, between the suspensory cortical endobutton with the interference screw fixation in terms of the functional outcome, knee laxity, or the re-rupture rates. So it still uh, comes back to the surgeon's preference. Uh, whether you want to use the endo button as or the uh, bio screw. But bear in mind that each patients are different. So you, there's no one size fit all uh, technique. Nah. For example, like I mentioned, if the patient has osteoporosis, you would better use uh, endo button suspensory uh, type of fixation. Whereas in young patient, probably you can use a bio screw. So now we come to the complications. So the most dreaded complication is the graft failure. The graft failure, 70% of the times, they are due to tunnel mouth formation, mouth position. And when the graft screw divergence is more than 30 degree, it, uh, it's higher as a high risk of a graft failure. And Sometimes uh, because of the misassociated injuries, for example, the anterior lateral ligament or the posterior lateral corner, uh, there will be rotational instability. And when you, the rehab protocol is not standardized, sometimes it can be over-aggressive. Uh, the patient wanted to return to sport too fast or uh, exercise too much, then it's uh, bound to be, have a graph failure. So uh, other complications such as atrofibrosis, which I've mentioned just now, and infection, saphenous nerve injury, tunnel osteolysis, hardware failure, and also secondary arthritis. And one of the rare complications is the chronic regional pain syndrome. This is a non-specific pain where the pain is out of proportion to the, uh, sim the clinical symptoms. And the specific to graft, uh, there's risk of patella fractures and patella tendon ruptures in those with who undergone uh, bone patella bone uh, graft harvesting or the quadricep tendon harvesting. So yeah, that concludes my presentation. Any questions? The one that we use now for the femoral tunnel, we use the suspensory system, and then for the tibial tunnel, we use the aperture, is it? Yeah, like, like I mentioned just now, uh, it's actually surgeon's preference, but you need to mention, uh, take into consideration the patient's uh, bone quality. For the for those with osteoporosis, bioscore is definitely not uh, suitable because of the high risk of uh, loosening. So that's why we use the endo button as well as the pin. As uh, in IAUM, normally, like what you mentioned, we use the uh, endo button over the femoral uh, fixation site and also uh, sometimes pin over the uh, tibial, insertion, tibial fixation site. But it still uh, comes back to surgeon's uh, preference. Uh. There's no... Uh, because literature didn't mention that which one is better than the other. So it's uh, at surgeon's uh, preference as well as uh, you tailor to the patient's condition. Any other questions? Kao, any difference in managing uh, SCL reconstruction in a patient with uh, hyperlexity? Hyperlexity. Mm. Is there any difference mm. of uh, doing ACL reconstruction or just the same? Okay, uh, I, I'm not sure about this topic, but uh, theoretically speaking, I think those with hyperlexity are at a lower risk of uh, ligamentous structure right? because they are more lax and they are more uh, pliable. So I... 
I think it's less, there's real less risk of ACL recall tear uh, in those patients. But I'm, I haven't go through the literature of it. The, if I'm not mistaken, they still sustain rupture, but in cases like that, you need to consider taking their own graft because uh, they already have laxity, so you would not, will not want to compromise their graft, like taking their cordyceps or their hamstring graft. Mm, okay. Oh, don't mind, can give a summary. Yeah. So basically, double bundle, single bundle, anatomical, oh. anatomical. Okay, so since there's no, no questions, so I'll uh, conclude this uh, presentation. So first, the take home message uh, is not all patients require ACL reconstructions. Okay, only those specific uh, candidates uh, who will benefit the most from ACL reconstruction requires this surgery. Uh, studies have mentioned that conservative management, re, re, uh, physiotherapy and rehabilitation protocol, they have uh, the functional outcome and also the complication, sec secondary complications, they are almost the same as uh, ACL reconstruction. So that's the first take home message. So in cases where you would like to do ACL reconstruction, so you can, uh, do either the uh, double bundle or single bundle. But in our center, I think in Malaysia, most of the centers, they are still doing the single bundle anatomical uh, fixation. So the anatomical fixation is between the AM and PL, just midway between the AM and PL. Whereas uh, for double bundle, you can consider it when you are trained for it, and when the patients has a high demand, such as elite athletes, okay. Next is the graph uh, option. So for graph options, uh, in our center, uh, specifically in Malaysia, most of the time we harvest the gracilis as well as uh, semi tendinosus, because most of our patients are Muslim patients who require kneeling for prayers. So that's the only uh, autograph that do not. Uh, affect the anterior knee. So next is the graft fixation device. So like I mentioned this now, it, it can be endo button, suspensory endo button, uh, pin or aperture such as bioscrew, depending on your preference. And then you must uh, bear in mind that rehabilitation is one of the main reason that patients do not achieve uh, as, as good as the functional outcome that, that they, they desire. So even after the ACL reconstruction, rehabilitation protocol must be uh, initiated immediately post on day one post-op. So briefly, I'll speak on the rehabilitation protocol. It can be divided into three phases, uh, the acute, uh, subacute, and return to work, and uh, return to sports. So the acute is the first within the first to one week to two weeks, mainly to control pain, control the swelling, and also to get the ROM. Then the next stage is to get a bit of uh, exercises to strengthen the muscles, and also next return to sports after the around four, six weeks, depending on the graph. Uh, for bone, patella bone is around six weeks. For uh, gracilis as, and the semi tendinosis is around 12 weeks. So after that period of time, then only you can consider the patients uh, to return to sports. So that will conclude the presentation. Any other questions? There was once, uh, uh, last time they, they, they believe in this exaggerated uh, rehab protocol. Uh, now they don't practice that anymore. Is, is it, or they still do that? Uh, <clears throat> for the rehab protocol, each center has their own uh, protocol. But the most important thing is you need to tailor to the uh, patient's uh, needs uh, as well as the patient's uh, functional status. The most one of the most important thing is to patient selection. Pre-operatively, make sure the patient uh, already undergo physiotherapy to get 
adequate quadriceps strength as well as uh, able to achieve full ROM. If the patient unable to achieve that prior to the ACL reconstruction, post-operatively, the functional outcome will not be as good as you desire. As for the uh, rehab protocol per se, the principles are still the same. It, three phases, acute, subacute, and return to sports. But uh, each center, they have their own tailored uh, specific exercise that they can teach. Uh, that varies center to center. Mm. But generally, the principles are the same. Okay. So if there's no uh, other questions, I would like to conclude this uh, presentation. Uh, so thank you, Prof, and thank you all the colleagues uh, for uh, joining this session. Anyone can budget to conclude this?